So the, the final talk is uh, Kate Stewart will talk about uh, essentially a solution that will make compliance much easier. I think that describes it pretty well. Okay. So, oops. Um, we just heard the last speaker talk about trying to go through and work through the compliance. Um, I spent probably the last 10 years in that building there trying to figure out how to comply. We've got sources coming in from multiple places, and in order for us to sell silicon, we had to basically ship out a Linux distribution with it. And when you start looking at the Linux distributions and looking at putting a user space together, putting some licenses, so forth, and saying, okay, how do I comply to this? It became a really interesting problem. Um, so, like I say, right now I, um, I changed jobs last year. I'm currently working with Canonical on Ubuntu, um, but all this work was pretty much in the seeds for this were the pain that I went through when I was working at uh, Freescale doing license compliance. So most of these questions there I was asking. And so you, we just heard the discussion of, to, okay, if you just pass on the source, that's fine. The trouble becomes is you've got uh, some new code you're adding in and you've got multiple other licenses and you're combining them together, and you're trying to figure out all the pieces that are there. And the information is not in a consistent form. It's coming in from different directions. You have to hunt from in different releases. Um, so all of a sudden, you've got multiple licenses you're trying to track and prepare, p perpetuate on. And then if you basically are taking multiple packages and putting it together, and you're getting things from outsource vendors, um, you know, you might contract to some want to basically give you a driver or you've, um, you know, someone, for instance, uh, does a codec and they have provided under certain terms, you have different terms that you have to work with and make resolve with the open source licensing as well. All of these things tend to make it a little bit more interesting as well as lining things up with the third party software. Um, so at the end of the day, for one company trying to ship things out, you having, getting an accurate um, build of materials is what it's generally called, a software build of materials is a slang term for this, um, of saying what's there and then what you actually have to do to comply becomes a challenge. And it takes a lot of effort. So while it may be very quick for the developers to pull the pieces together, uh, to figure out actually what you have to do to comply um, involves significant effort sometimes if you don't have your processes set up properly up front. And the problem then becomes compounded as you work your way through supply chain. So like that um, device we just saw, um, you know, you'd say multiple OEM vendors are taking it. So if someone takes it, puts a little bit more on, someone else takes it, puts a bit more on, puts a bit more on. And the supply chain plays a role here in terms of things modifying slightly as you go along. At the end of the day, it becomes very complicated to get all the pieces together. And so we, um, I was basically looking at this and started talking to some of my um, colleagues in other embedded vendor companies and we uh, started talking to people at like the Linux Foundation and so forth and you know Motorola, um, various places, players like that and the need to gain the standard format for conveying this information was became pretty clear to us and so came up with a proposal last year, so I don't know, were any of you in Wellington last year? Ah, good. Were you at um, the talk? Package Facts proposal? Oh, well. So, <laughs> last year at Wellington was the start of this Package Facts proposal. Um, and so I came up with, you know, okay, this is what we roughly need to keep track of. And basically presented it at um, conference, and that sort of started things off. Um, so, we software, um, software package data exchange is basically looking at what facts on the licensing and copyrights are you going to provide and coming up with a standard way of communicating them. The idea being if you're sending a package of software along, you can send the licensing obligations along with it. What's been sort of talked about um, you know, on Android and various other people have their own individual ones. The idea is to standardize it across the industry so that um, it becomes fairly neutral as a format and we can actually exchange the information without having to dive into it 20 different fashions. Um, 
It's become one of the key pillars of the uh, open compliance program that Matthew was just referencing. And um, it's initially got its start as a working group under the FOSS Bazaar, and they are now um, the support of, their, of that organization has been valued, very valuable to us for making this possible for us to collaborate across. Um, to get this to happen, you're basically getting release managers, you're getting technologists, you're getting lawyers, you're getting business people. Because these are all the elements that really have to make sure their needs are satisfied for the whole supply chain to work with the Linux ecosystem, the open source ecosystem. And this does extend actually beyond open source too. Um, so this was at the end of the last LCA talk, sort of, okay, we're going to go to a phase one and phase two, like any good little plan. And the first phase is, okay, let's standardize on a way of encoding it. Um, I think it sounds reasonably straightforward. Uh, when you start digging into it, there's a lot of interesting issues there. There's a lot of interesting issues. I'll go into a little bit as I go through some of the details of the file formats. Um, but we wanted to, you know, so it has to be uniquely identified. You have to have some degree of confidence that the data hasn't been corrupted on you or changed out from underneath you. And you have to have everything fairly identified. And then once you've you know, got a format, you need to be have a way of sharing it and being able to pass it on. So those are the, sort of the two elements. Um, and we've made actually a fair amount of progress on phase one, and we're sort of heading into the phase two quite nicely at this point. But I'll illustrate that, and hopefully you'll be convinced as well. So we're a working group of FOSS Bazaar. The charter is to create this uh, data exchange standard for enabling these companies to um, share licenses and components for these software packages. And with the aim of facilitating the compliance, obvious. Um, it's grassroots. And we're not doing it as a standard organization, which was one of the options we initially discussed. We're actually running as an open source project. So those who actually care about the issue and want to participate are doing it. And certain companies um, have vested interests in, you know, as part of the business. They're participating directly um, because of consulting revenue eventually for them, and as well as because it'll make their job easier. Like any open source project, it scratches an itch for them. So here's a bit of the background of the participants that have been actively engaged in it with us um, and have come together to, you know, and there's more that have been lurking. I've got a lot of evidence of lurkers, actually. Um, but, you know, we've got a fairly broad spectrum coming to um, people working here with different perspectives. And so hopefully we'll be able to figure out most of what's needed in the first go. Realistically, anything we do like this, we're all pretty realistic. 1.0 isn't going to be perfect. Uh, we'll go on, but we're trying to sort of future proof a little bit and try to get as close as we can initially. So the working group operation um, is there's about three main working groups that are have formed. Um, initially, it started as one SPDX group. And then we started finding out that there was people wanting to talk about the legal issues. And they were boring the technical folk. And then there's the technical folk who were really getting into, OK, how this file formats are going. And the lawyers are going, what's happening to my inbox here? I don't understand what's going to my inbox. And then the business guys were going, yeah, OK, so how do you make it real? Uh, and, and so like I say, we had th you know, three different constituencies really coming in. And so over the last, I guess, two or th I guess about last quarter, um, we started actually forming into sub-working groups where you can have the more detailed discussions in your own area of expertise. So if you had looked at it before and you want to come back, if, you, if there's an area in particular that's interesting to you, feel free to join into them. Um, because we have people who care about the um, intellectual properties and things like that, we decide pretty much up front we're going to be creative. Anything that we come up with is Creative Commons and the copyrights effectively are going to be the Linux Foundation. Again, to remove problems, and because we weren't working with the standard, uh, we wanted to make sure we kept whatever we did, we were, we were keeping it in a neutral format. And, and then um, at the last LCA talk, um, the person before me was Joss Burkus talking all about how not to create a community and all the things that could go wrong. And so I was paying very, very close attention. And I think a lot of those lessons, um, we've managed to, the fact that we've grown and we've got so many diverse people participating. I actually highly recommend listening to Josh's talk if you're actually looking at trying to get things going. It was very good and very timely. So the specification goals are, you know, um, realistically we had one guiding principle that we got right from the start from talking to the legal people who basically tried this and failed. Um, and we had to stick to the facts. We couldn't do interpretations. Interpretations and putting things together is the realm of the lawyers and making risk assessments and legal judgments. So we had to 
we're, and we're still playing a tension point between how much you can figure out in the code through tooling and justify um, versus how much is, mm, I think it's this. And how much background, like, okay, I've talked to this person on this site, on this person on this site, and gotten the information, you know, some of those things. So it's what's in the code is what we're trying to mostly stick to. But there are certain cases where certain tools will, you know, determine that, hmm, gee, this code here is under this, this code fragment matches this GPL code from 10 years ago. And a lot of the commercial um, tool vendors have these type of capabilities right now. So um, the file format, um, we've been trying to figure out, okay, what's a license? And I'll go into that a little bit. The other thing is we wanted to come up with a standard set of short names. Um, there are, well, you, when you refer to GPL, which variant of GPL are you referring to specifically? What are the standard exceptions? So we were looking at to try to come up with a quick way of referring to a license as well. And so this also was an interesting little um, discussion with all sorts of interesting viewpoints on it and multiple different attempts that had to be harmonized a bit. Um, but we figured if we could get these two things, which was the specification and some standard short names, we were going to be advancing things a lot farther than they were. And uh, Last August, we came out with the first draft, beta draft in public, um, put it out LinuxCon, and then since then, um, we've been getting some feedback and working on things, and we're hoping to get the release candidate um, nailed down for Q2. So what is the next PDX file? Uh, the specification is for creating a file, and it will contain identification information, package, um, which Sarah says, okay, how, who created this file? What was there? Package information is the information about um, what you're talking about, the SPDX file. The SPDX the file basically talks about a package. And we're not defining what a package is. It's anything that's a tarball or anything that you want to put together and call a package, you can call a package. The key being it's something that has, um, it's a, a discrete quantity that you, dis you determine. And then anything in there, you're basically listing all the information for. Um, we also had the fact that not all these licenses are going to be part of these short form licenses. So we wanted to have a, a way of handling these non-standard licenses. Well, we found a couple of fragments that sort of look like it might be a license sitting in the code. We don't know if it really is or not. We want to be able to capture it so that the lawyers down the road can take a look at it and apply legal judgment appropriately. And then um, what's actually happening in some cases is um, at the various package level, um, you are saying that this license is one thing, and you start digging down into the files, and you start going right to the file level, and you say, and you see all sorts of other little licenses sitting there. That's part of the pulling it all from different places, right? Um, and most of the cases, this is fairly benign. Um, but in some cases, it'll bite you if you're not aware of it. Um, and so, you know, there's been cases, there's, you know, there's been a case in the past, in my prior life, where, you know, you just, have to make a different choice about what you're going to ship because you can't comply. And finding those things out late in life or before you made it, you know, it's costly. The closer you are to release and when it's time to money on an embedded front, the more you're going to lose. So that's it. And then the other notion that we wanted to have is this whole supply chain of passing information on. We wanted to have a way of capturing if someone's saying, yeah, I've audited this already. So if you've basically got a file and someone's gone and audited and cross-checked that it makes sense and they want to sign off on it, being able to pass that information on builds trust. So, you know, we've been um, looking at putting a reviewer sign off by. So the concept being you, up, you upstream a patch, the maintainer will basically take and look at it and apply it to your kernel. Same thing. They do a sign off on it. that They've re reviewed it and it looks good. So the identification information, what that really is is, okay, what version of SPDX is going to be in use? Uh, 1.0 is um, what we're going to call the first version. But like I say, we don't think we'll get it right. So we wanted to make sure we had some way of versioning so again, the tooling can future-proof. Um, how was it generated? Was it a person or a tool? And when was it done? And then, um, you know, how, the other thing that was sort of an interesting aspect that came up from discussions is you cannot um, license your copyright and license facts, but you can the attribution of the person doing the work, apparently, I learned. is, And so the question is, OK, um, this data, what license is the person providing it to you under to use? Which was sort of an interesting meta issue that didn't come up initially in the thinking. But 
um, because we've got a lot of good lawyers <laughs> on this group, um, they were basically saying, uh, let's make sure that we can make it explicit. And we're going to put a default license in there that perpetuates and lets people push things forward. Um, but if people want to basically only provide this information under a specific NDA terms or something like that, they have that ability, which is going to be um, not the preferred way, but it's for adoption and there's certain business needs sometimes that have to be worked on around. And then the other thing is, it's in grade, um, is the notion of an author comment uh, where the person who's been doing, authoring this file um, has to, wants to make um, information available to the consumers of the file. And that's an optional field. So anything that's been grayed out right now is, is considered optional fields. So that's the first part that's just the identification information of the SPDX file itself. At the package level, um, you have your standards, you know your name, um, the file name appropriately, where it's been downloaded from if it's known. Um, and then if you want to record the SHA of that tarball, you can do that. Um, and then also uh, checksumming um, of the file base, checksum all the information at the file level. If we can do a checksum of the XORs of the SHAs, we have a way of fairly uniquely identifying that nothing's been tampered with, and that's one of the key facilities. Is because um, we've seen in the past where you say that the license is for this for the area, and the file changes underneath it, and that destroys the analysis. So you want to know that the analysis has been destroyed and if you're validating it, and that the sources you're looking at are actually still matching. And the reason the package level on its own, doing it at the package level on its own doesn't work is uh, we wanted to be able to have a way for people to embed this into the file. And you can't do a SHA on yourself, or it gets very, very tricky to do a SHA on yourself with yourself in it. <laughs> so you can have it outside or inside um, by using this uh, XOR on the files itself. And um, the source analysis information, any anomalies, again, commentary was requested by uh, a lot of the commercial vendors. And the declared license for the package, um, this is what's been in the copying file, the readmes and so forth. This is what you're expecting it to be. Um, but then also we're recording at this top level, uh, especially an and of all these scene licenses, as well as, um, and it's a pretty quick flag to someone to say, okay, um, all the scene licenses aren't quite matching declared licenses. Do I care more to go down and deep and understand at the file level what's going on? If all the scene licenses match the declared license, probably things are fine. So you don't have to go down at the file level, but at least you have that capability there. And then the declared copyright holder, and then you know some optional fields for more description if you want. And that's pretty much one per SPDX file for these. For the non-standard licenses, a unique identifier, and then the extracted text of whatever you found is what's going to happen in that section. And at the file specific level, again, the name, the type, um, the SHA of its content, the SHA of it itself, and then the asserted license. The C and then this is one of the areas where I was sort of saying the licenses are a little bit interesting um, in that sometimes the license that's actually written in the file is not really the license that governs the file. And um, these cases seem to have caused a certain degree of consternation. And so um, the compromise that came up with is we probably record what the asserted license is with what the tools and analysis believe the license to be, um, as well as what is actually in the file. And you sort of need both to have trust. And then any comments, you have optional comments to explain why they might be different if you want. And then the copyright information is seen. And then another optional field to say, hmm, this file was actually part of a different project if someone's discovered that. Again, this is part of, okay, can you get the traceability and the information you need? And then for the op sign offs on the review information, um, you know, basically uh, your name and your timestamp when you signed off on it. And that's the only thing that pretty much can get added to the files once the initial version is created. Is the thinking here that you've signed off. So the short form um, names for licenses are going in, in Appendix 1 in the uh, specification. And um, as of version 1.5 of it, we have 151 documented right now as in a spreadsheet. And I'll talk a bit more about what we're doing in terms of moving them over to uh, web. So specification status since October, uh, sorry, since um, August. We've had the 1.0. What we're doing right now is um, RDF, the specifications being RDF as encoded as RDF XML. And there's also a tag syntax variable, it's tag syntax, more like textual tag strings. And so harmonizing those two to make it still readable, which is one of the original goals, has been a good source of discussion and debate. 
Um, and then we're also taking and moving from just a text document from the spec into an RGF ontology that will generate an HTML file with the spec in it. And so we're moving that over to a Git infrastructure so that we have a revision control and keeping it going forward. And so if you're um, any questions or comments in that area, uh, the SPDX Tech is the uh, group that's focusing on these issues. Um, in terms of the licenses, um, we're trying to go for the most common ones and the standard license names, as well as some of the common exceptions. So we're not going to, so, you know, and the short forms themselves are um, trying to get, they've come from some precedents. So there's basically the Red Hat precedents and the Debian precedents for short forms. Um, those were the two most common set of examples we found. And um, Debian's also been working on a DEP5, which is a machine uh, readable format of encoding as part of their packaging, too. So trying to get everything to harmonize together with the names is one of the focus areas for us. And um, once we actually have these short form names, we'll probably be making sure that we have the information available on a website um, such that the information is canonically there. If we're using a short form as part of the spec, there will be a web page that um, I'll show them. here. The web page that will basically show its name, uh, the full name of the license, where it is, what the standard text is, what the standard headers are, and then a neutral version of it, as well as um, notes about it, if there are any. Is it OSI approved and so forth? So we're going to be using the website as a way of basically giving us a reference. And so um, to say, OK, if you're using a uh, SP, an SPDX spec, if you're using a license, this license short form, here you can go find all the information you want about it in one spot and to keep that up and going. And then the conclusion, um, trying to figure out what licenses to include and which ones not has had some fun. Um, you ha because you're recording all that information, um, trying to decide, okay, being exhaustive and you know, using, listing all the 19, every license you discover and put it in um, is a lot of work and for little gain. So we were sort of aiming for about 90% coverage. And in realistic, you know, um, about 20 actual licenses are responsible for most of the open source world right now. Um, if you are interested in licenses and so forth, I'd actually highly encourage you to go look at Black Duck's site there with their top 20. It's really quite interesting which ones actually make it up there. Um, and then there's about 80 that have been ratified as open source, and so that was also some of the guidelines that we went in. And so we used those two as our starting points, and then it was quite frankly, pe as people who are in the industry have been working at it, they've been countering common ones, they were basically bringing them forward and saying, hey, you forgot this one, you forgot this one. And yeah, we have forgotten some. And so that's pretty much where we're going, and then we also basically what Debian's been doing and Fedora's been doing, and trying to, again, figure out a good subset from there. And that was the template. And then the status of the repository itself is the 151 licenses. Um, and we've actually been working with um, various, the legal, some of the key lawyers are caring about these things. We're working to actually get some of the ambiguous ones resolved a little bit better. The Python stack in particular was causing a bit of grief on the analysis side. And so I think we've been working uh, with the Python Foundation to actually sort of say this is what they mean in these cases. So I think that'll be a little bit of a service that, you know, We'll have one place to actually sort of say, okay, these are the key licenses and this is why. Or some of the analysis is there. Um, but for the most part, they're all fairly straightforward. And we've just been, you know, documenting and learning. Um, what the processes we'll be using going forward to add um, licenses to the list. Um, the legal and the business teams are developing those right now. Um, you know, if someone wants to know me, because licenses license will get written tomorrow, you know, every day someone's writing, maybe writing another license or deciding, no, they have to put this out under their terms, and then we'll want this to be able to be included in the future. So coming up with a process that's reasonable for adding and choosing the license that will get added so it doesn't become a kitchen sink is um, part of what that team's working on, as well as coming up with ways of encoding the neutral version of the license. This is so that the scanning tools can use it. Um, by that, what I'm meaning is Generally, white space isn't significant. Punctuation, maybe. Um, you know, British versus um, U.S. spellings of things. Um, okay, it has to be matched this, except this whatever is in the copyright field. You know, that what's in that copyright field doesn't necessarily matter. The license matches. And so, coming up with a templated version of that license that can be used to help scanning tools is one of the areas. And so, there's been some discussions with some of the fossology and. Um, 
um, Daniel German, who's been doing some tools on that side. So coming up with a reasonable way of representing that is a dual as well. And then coming, the technical team's been looking at, okay, coming up with a template to support some parsing hooks so that people can automatically index into things that they care about uh, to the reference. And so, as I say, one year later, I think we've got you know, a good number of those elements now starting to be covered. And what's next? Well, what's next is coming and continuing to develop the infrastructure, uh, continuing to refine the specification, and gain more tools online. Because when you're dealing with, you know, uh, packages that have 30,000 files in them, uh, this, some of this stuff is a little bit prohibitive by hand. And uh, we're also looking at to test drive this specification and tools with some friendly beta sites and um, establish these frameworks for changing the specification license in the future. So that's what's keeping us amused. In terms of the infrastructure, um, we do have a website up now. It came up um, last June, July. Yes, and we've the there's a wiki up there for collaboration, and um, we've also basically broken it down into teams, and so you can go and navigate there. There are open mail lists, which is one of the things we did not have initially, um, and archives for them are exist and are available. So if you want to follow the threads of the discussions, and pick up, by all means, subscribe to any of them. There's also bug tracking now available as of about a month ago. We've got Bugzilla going, so thank you to the Linux Foundation for providing a Bugzilla capacity for us, as well as a Git capacity for the tooling. So um, the bugs in the spec are starting to get documented, let's put it that way. And the pretty print tool and translation tools up, as well as a, um, the areas that we can track bugs against right now are the website itself, uh, the specification, the tools exist, um, the license list, and then documentation. So we have a way of at least you know, starting to track and keep ourselves honest going forward. And then revision control finding the source code is good. Uh, and then in terms of the tools needed for this, well, you've got create a file, read a file, and validate it. Those are the three main things. Um, there's some open source tools that we're starting to work on. And then there's also the commercial tools. Um, key vendors here are um, Black Duck, OpenLogic, Palomita. And they're all participating in this to make sure whatever the tooling they're coming up with will be talking to this effectively. Um, you'll see their names fairly prominently participating here. So there's, there's some support going in for tool creation. Um, we're trying to get grammar and, the grammar syntax, the flex bison files for the SPDX file itself. So that'll help with the tools that want to parse them. There's the RDF ontology as well as some online audio file data already exist, and we've been passing through, um, our ontologies through them to make sure the examples we've been coming up with are looking good and are actually coherent. And then there's also, right now, there's open source license and copyright recognition tools that exist today from Fossology and from Ninka. So those are the ones. Um, in terms of the tools that we're looking at, um, again, these are people that basically stood up and volunteered and said, I want to do this tool. Um, and so the pretty printer is Gary. And the um, translator is Gary O'Neill, has been working on taking the lead on that. And would welcome any other one else to, co to collaborate with him and contribute. So this will hopefully help. We'll be using these for the betas and working from there. And the Spreadsheet translator, this came about because um, a lot of companies um, were basically tracking this information in spreadsheets. And this is how people understand it. OK, I'm seeing nodding heads here. <laughs> so moving back and forth between RDF and spreadsheet should be quite possible. And so that was one of the things that was definitely a request that came in. And then if you want to contribute, um, again, the tech group is where to go. And feel free to look at the sources. So all of this is in prep for um, getting business users to use it. Because if we don't get it adopted in a widespread um, system, it's not going to effectively be flying. So we're trying to minimize getting 1.0 wrong <laughs> by actually working with some real customers up front. And there are several organizations participating in this that are willing to sign up and do it. So we've got, um, we've got I think, five or six right now. And we're trying to get about 10, up to 10, and then at least with some pairs. And the other thing is we'd also like to try to do is get um, some of the open source um, upstream projects and make sure that this is suitable for them as well. 
So that's sort of where we're targeting to get some beta activity and um, putting together the pieces to help people. And so if anyone's interested in that, the mail list is the biz group. They're, they're the ones active right now. And um, the wiki information that we're doing for the beta program is sort of sitting, up on, sitting on the site. So why we're doing it, obviously, from one company to another, translating it, making sure that one can read and produce and the other writes it, and it's, it's really going to be useful for what they're doing. And these are the elements that we're looking at for the program itself. Um, Obviously, the, license, the spec and license data are one part, but um, when you start to dig into what's actually going to make it real in the field, there's a lot of things we've got to get going. Um, we've got to get a variety of uh, training materials and education materials available to educate people about this, what, how to use and so forth, because this will be pretty much be used by um, supply chain. And so incoming and outgoing, people are basically bringing software in, putting software out, putting out the compliance, putting out the profits. Okay. How do you use this information? How do you basically push it? Um, evangelism and outreach, making people aware of it exists. And um, you know, I suspect that some of our beta programs are going to be asking for their downstream to give it to them as part of their contracts in future and things like that. If, so there'll be adoption from multiple different directions. Um, we have to deal with the translation and localization issues. Um, they're really sending one basically taking lead, but eventually that will have to get resolved as well as obviously the tool, getting the tooling available, which you've seen on the starting of it, and um, the processes, ongoing processes defined for interacting and involving this. And then there's all the planning and coordination of the data programs, as well as, okay, do we have someone to answer the, you know, so we have someone to answer questions if someone asks a question, what's the support channel? Um, you know, is someone asking questions, is someone hand-holding, things like that. And then there is resources for that. So. For a beta program as well as a wider program, these are some of the elements where um, the business group is basically looking to try to put in place so this can be successful as part of a, because uh, uh, the feeling is in certain areas we really need to try to get as close to right as possible at the first time when it's finally done. So in terms of a timeline, um, beta testing is probably going to be happening between April and June this year. and. Uh, then we will probably try to get that 1.0 spec finalized uh, for LinuxCon so we can sort of, one year later, declare it done. So that's what we're sort of marching to right now. And the next steps here are the starting the beta program, um, finalizing that 1.0 version. This is what's sort of going on for the next couple months, as well as doing some of the brainstorming on the uh, things that, questions that come up, they get tracked that we can't answer right now. Well, those go into the bug repository so we don't lose them for 2.0. And then we'll see where we go. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you to all the people who've been following uh, this and contributing to mail lists and phone calls and the office and um, hallway discussions. They've really, from where the, disc the proposal was a year ago till now, it's quite changed. You know, it really has improved a lot. And um, the various working group people. So if you want to learn more, um, there's a couple sites, places to see. And if you're interested in specific areas, I'd encourage you to join any of the mail lists um, or else contact one of the leads directly. And so, and with that, I guess, um, is there any questions? Yeah. Hi. Um. Hi. I'm from uh, Qualcomm, uh, Qualcomm Open Source Portal. I see you've, you've worked with a couple of my colleagues there uh, uh -huh. from my group. Um, uh, one thing that uh, I know from my experience uh, at Qualcomm is, so, so this sort of information is, is carted around in spreadsheets at the moment. Um, but if you, if you go to where the decisions are finally made regarding the, um, uh, whether or not to, to use this particular software package or, mm -hmm. or you know, when this business decision is made about, about yeah how we're going to ship this or whether we're going to ship this or whether this is acceptable. Uh, at that point in time, no one looks at this detailed information. The only people that look at that are, are lawyers, really. Right. Um, and, you know, the, so, so my, my question is, is whether you intend to, to, to look at sort of diagrammatic representations in the future? Because uh, all I see in these sort of meetings are, uh, you know, simplified diagrammatic representations of... Uh, uh, that convey both the licensing and how the software is constructed. I'd actually be interested in 
getting with you offline and seeing what your, your diagrams look like uh, in terms of just a sketch for it. Yeah. Um, realistically, this is to make the information for those who are people who are producing the diagrams easier to find. It's um, and it is not meant to replace um, the risk assessments that have to happen at a business level and the advice that the lawyers are given. It's just basically to make the information there and easier for the lawyers so you have less work to pull the information together because uh, I spent many, 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 many nights and weekends going through files trying to find out things and the idea that I was basically looking at the same package that my colleague at Wind River was looking at that another colleague at Monte Vista was looking at and we were doing the same due diligence to basically try to give the information, can we ship this or not, it was waste. And so the, trying to get the stuff summarized, then let's say the, the right level of analysis be focused down and the diagrams, as you say, being decision, being made and decisions made. Yeah, so you, so you the subsequent <laughs> question is, do you see the need for, for standardization of, of how the, the information is summarized and presented at a higher level or uh, is this uh, just out of scope for That's now? definitely like, 2.0, maybe. Okay. <laughs> I, I just want to get the want to get the foundations there and solid. What else? Uh, can I? Uh, I just want to clarify the intent. I guess uh, in one way, uh, with the SPDX. Uh, file format essentially. Uh, mm -hmm. is, that, is there a suggestion that in an ideal world that, you know, if you go to SourceForge and, and look at, um, you know, open source software there, mm -hmm. you would have the software there and an associated SPDX file? Is that where you sort of Ideally, heading? we'd like to be able to, we'd like to have that option available. Okay. Okay. Um, having that option there, I think it's going to be necessary for the long term. Success is such that when you basically produce the file, you produce an ex, like you package, you produce the SPDX. Um, Debian's going there right now with DEP5, and that standard is there for producing And then you were hearing what they were doing with Android, which is again sort of similar. The trouble is that all these things don't interoperate, and you have different levels of trust. And so that's why, we're, that's why a lot of the discussion and debate has been going on. How do we make sure that we have trust that what's there is not changed out from under you? And that's one of the new dimensions. So, so um, towards the end there, you had something about... Um essentially advertise and evangelize you know, yeah. where you're heading. Yeah. Uh, so is there also talk going on with uh, uh, the SourceForge crowd for um, one of a better I'm, term? If I'm looking for, like I said, I'm starting to talk to the Debian folk. Uh, as there's upstream projects that are interested in participating or talking to me, I'm happy. I'd love to talk on the SourceForge side as well as others. It's just a question of bandwidth and reaching out because I'm doing this as an open source project right. for myself as well just because... It seems like my life will become easier in the future, as well as uh, <laughs> many other people's will. And I've been engaged in this now, so. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you.